Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Tonight is a not very online meeting. It's mostly in person tonight, but that's okay. We are recording it nonetheless, and hopefully it will actually work on Big Blue Button tonight. As a backup option, I'm also recording it via um, Open Broadcast Studio, OBS, on locally on my laptop, so that's why I can monitor the chat. So if you actually should be joining later on, online, just chime in, please. Tonight, we have been talking about MicroPython and how to actually deal with it first. In the first part, how to deal with the hardware on the Raspberry Pi Pico. And then in the second part of this talk, what to do with software. Thank you very much. Oh, just one quick one. Thanks to our sponsors, as always. The School of Computing and Mathematical Sciences here at the University of Waikato for the room, and the New Zealand Open Source Society for the big blue button instance for recording and running the online meeting. But without much further ado, Ian, all yours. OK, thanks, Peter, and um, good evening, everyone. Um, as you can see, we're going to talk about uh, MicroPython for Raspberry Pi Pico. And um, the first part of my slideshow is, um, is really just going through the hardware. And if we take a look at the hardware, um, You've sort of got this um, Russian doll type approach. Um, you've got ARM processors in the inside, and then around that we have a chip that's made by Raspberry Pi called the RP2040 chip. And then surrounding that we have the Pico module, which comes also from Raspberry Pi. And then off to the side of drawn it is um, there are Pico kits, um, there are add-ons, sensors that you can by and there's um, a third party um, uh, make uh, products to connect to a Pico module. So um, that, that's the sort of ranking of the hardware. We start with the ARM Cortex processor core, then the 2020 chip and the Pico module. And then the next part of it, we, we um, cover the software. The um, uh, there is a C and C++ um, download that you can do to have the um, chip run C programs, or there is um, MicroPython, which is what we'll be looking at. Um, we just start from the inside. Um, ARM Cortex M0 Plus. This is, um, comes from ARM Holdings, formerly Acon Risk Machines, and... Um, also had a name change later on to Advanced Risk Machines before, is that what they are now? ARM. Anyway, and um, that, um, they create and license the technology as intellectual property. They don't actually make um, CPUs in a, a foundry. Um, the Cortex-M0 Plus is a 32-bit risk ARM core processor, uses the ARM V6M architecture, and um, it's apparently one of the smallest ARM um, microcontrollers. I saw on Wikipedia it said something like in 2014, its footprint on a, um, on a, on a integrated circuit was two millimeters by 1.6 or something. So I don't know what, I would imagine that's gone down considerably in the last eight years. So, okay, so um, uh, the... Um, Raspberry Pi Company decided to make a, um, a chip, and uh, you can purchase this chip from uh, PB Tech or Element 14 for $1.66. And um, this has been designed by Raspberry Pi uh, Limited. And in the past, your Raspberry Pi has all used Broadcom as the designer, and I think they're also a foundry, uh, Broadcom, for... for um, for the chips that they used in the Raspberry Pi. So I guess this cuts out one of the middlemen. They're still, because they're using licensed um, processors, two, two processors inside the chip from ARM, then there's still a few cents out of the $1.66 goes to the ARM company. Um, okay, some aspects of this chip, it's uh, clocked at 133 megahertz, there's two, two CPUs. 250, uh, 264 KB uh, uh, on-chip uh, RAM. Um, 
it, it can support up to 16 megabytes of offset flash. Um, particular, we'll see later we use two megabytes. Um, a fully connected, the AHB, I think, what's it, Advanced High Performance Bus, is the crossbar that allows um, for your pins that come out of the chip can have multiple functions. And, and you have a crossbar so that you can say, right, this pin uh, at the moment will be a UART. And um, later on, you can say, I want that pin to be a um, I don't know, something else. <laughs> so, so the crossbar is what allows all that switching to occur. Um, what else? It, it, it um, ha has what's a low dropout regulator. So the chip, uh, the, the chip itself gets fed with, um, I'm pretty sure it's 3.3 volts, and then it it runs all the I/O pins with the 3.3, um, and the core voltage for the CPU and stuff is running at 1.1 volts. So um, I guess it reduces through rates, and times, and things like that. Um, it has um, phase lock loops uh, to generate the USB um, functionality. Oh, and the core clock. So there must be two volts to generate. There is 30 GPIO pins, and four of those can be used as A to D converters. Okay. And other things it has is two UARTs, small peripheral controllers, I squared C controllers. Um, 16 pulse with modulated channels and um, what's this, a USB controller. And uh, the eight physical I.O. machine states, I think that's what it stands for, PIO, programmable input output, sorry, machine states, is uh, state machines. Uh, I think that's to do with um, when you've got lots of devices, you don't want one hanging, hanging up the whole system. So you can sort of have eight um, things, threads or whatever, running at once. I think that that's what it means by that. Anyway, that's that's the chip that the Raspberry Pi company has come up with. And um, if we were to cut the top off and zoom in a bit, um, we're, it's seven millimeters by seven millimeters, so that's quite a zoomed in look. Um, here we find Prop One Zero and Prop One. Those are the two ARM um, uh, Cortex M Zero Plus processors. Um, and that's um, the uh, programmable I/O for those being those processors. Um, major chunks of the chip are used for the um, 256KB of RAM. It's got a ROM there, and as far as I know, the ROM is used to uh, when you first power it on. It's got uh, you've got to be able to load your flash RAM, which is external. Okay. And that's really like your disk drive. You've got to get the OS down to your disk drive. So um, as far as I know, that ROM contains the code that is, is that does that. Um, I don't know how you run, do an upgrade to that SROM, <laughs> whether it's possible or whether... Um, um, and one thing I think, although there's not really like a... Uh, I don't think it, they release the, the, um, how the chip is made, uh, I think the ROM code is available on GitHub. So, uh, whereas I think Broadcom with the Raspberry Pi chips, it was, there was still quite a lot of confidential uh, firmware that you didn't know. So, they seem a bit more open, these guys. Up here, we've got voltage regulators. There's an um, analog to digital converters, which three of them come are available. And there's an internal temperature sensor inside the chip. So one of the ADC converters is used to be monitoring that temperature. Um, okay, well that's kind of what it would look like. Um, if we look at the pinout, it's, um, like I said, it's um, seven mil by seven mil, 14 surface mount pins, what they call quad flat, no leads, leads. Um, 14 pins on each, uh, each side of the chip. Um, we see we've got GPI zero down to 11, a couple of things in between, 12 through to 17, 18 up to 29. And 
Um, these last ones, 26, 7, 8, and 9, are the analog to digital converter 0, 1, 2, and 3. And um, I think number 4 is the internal temperature sensor, so he never gets exposed outside the chip. Um, although this up here says ADC, AVDD, that sounds like analog to digital or something like that, but it's always painted orange. Um, Okay, so yeah, 56 pins come out, um, and bear in mind that, well, we'll see later. We don't use, we don't actually get to all of them. In fact, I'll just point out now, I think 23, 24, 25, and 29 do not get used. Um, well, well, they get used, but not by me, <laughs> by you. Okay, uh, what have we got? 3.3 um, volts for the I.O., 1.1 volts for the chip's digital core. Um, this is a block diagram of inside the, um, the chip. Um, here we've got two processors. Um, this is this bus fabric, I think, is um, sort of a switching terminology. And so that's providing which, um, you know, uh, like UART or pulse width modulation is, is sent to which pins. Okay. So um, in the case where there's multiple devices. Here's your RAM down here, it's in separate banks and uh, the ROM uh, clock over here. Crystal is external. Um, to, oh, yeah, this here must be external. No, I'm showing it inside. Oh, I didn't think there was a crystal inside the chip. This is one outside. Okay, um, moving on. How did it come up with his name? The RP stands for Raspberry Pi. The two was the number of cores. And then they do some fun, fun oh no, then the um, processor type, that zero is um, is the type of ARM core that's being used. Um, then the, the number four is math.floor, brackets math.log2, and then we've got 256,000 divided by 16,000, and we end up with four. So that's there, you know, indicating the amount of uh, RAM that four is there, and we've got no non-volatile RAM, so a zero there. Um, the, the, we move on now from the chip to putting the chip onto a module, which is something that Raspberry Pi and others do. And um, in this case, um, we've got the first one on the left, you can see the Raspberry Pi chip right in the middle on the wall and uh, that this is the um, has has no headers so those little holes are designed that you could uh, either directly wire devices into it and your power up to it or you can um, uh, uh, surface mount it onto another module okay these ones here the pico h is um if the header pins uh, are plugged into the, uh, have been soldered in. So it comes with a set of header pins. That way you can plug it into a breadboard. Uh -huh. There's um, the Pico W has come out now. And uh, uh, that basically this little chunk that's been added here is the wireless, the Wi-Fi. Okay. And in theory, there's going to be a Pico WH, but I haven't seen that either in Element 14 or... Um, um, PB Tech yet, and uh, that will just also have header pins. So that's more for the ones with header pins. You can put on a breadboard and develop your program and your your hardware configuration and test it, and then go for one of these ones which is cheaper that doesn't have the the headers. Um, and this pricing, there wasn't much difference between Element 14 or um, uh, PB Tech. Yeah, so around about eight bucks, ten bucks, twelve bucks. So I, my guess is this one will be around about fourteen. Not out, not out yet. Um, that you can also buy them in five packs and get the price down to seven a, a little bit. Um, so that was when I ordered this. I just ordered one, and it, and it came. Cut off like that. Now just cut it off. Everyone else, everyone else. Um, right. Um, 
And in fact, you can get a role. Yeah, you're like, holy shit. You can, if you want to get into, um, take it seriously. So I'm sure mine was just, when I ordered one, I just chop it off, swing back, and ship it to me. Okay. Um, so that's the Pico module. We'll look inside it a bit more. Um, we've got these GPIO ports. 0 to 15, 16, 17, 89, 21, 22, no 23, no 24, no 25. 26, 7, and 8 are the analog to digital converters. And then this, I think, ADC V ref is, um, is really ADC 3. And then the ADC 4 remains internal within the chip. Um, as you can see, the, the, the pins can be programmed for different functions. So this one here can have um, uh, what are the SPIO up receiver. It can also be an I squared C um, bus uh, pin, and it also can be a, U, a UART pin. So that, that's what that fit, switch. When you when you program it, you say what you want the pin to do. Do you want it just to be a, a GPIO pin, or do you want that to be a UART, that sort of thing. Um, just with VBUS is the five volts that comes in on the USB port. VSYS is what you can feed it if you've got nothing plugged into the USB port. So, and it, I won't cover that later. But um, and then uh, the V three point three out is um, whether whether you feed voltages in here, it will it will give you a three point three out which you can then use for your pins. The pins should not be fed with five volts. The maximum voltage for a pin theoretically is 3.3, okay? Um, uh, and there's a little plug down the bottom here. This is um, what's a debugging thing. I believe everything can possibly get locked up and um, or corrupted or something. And so therefore that should just clear everything out and you can reload. Things and uh, when I said GPI, GP, um, uh, general GPIO pin 25 is missing, they've drawn it up here with the lead, and they say that's GPI, GP25. Okay, so GPIO pin 25 out of the chip goes up through a resistor into that lead, and there's also a test point, I think, but the. I, it doesn't show the back of the chip. There's about six test points, and there's no actual components on the back. Um, as I know. Yeah. Um, oh, one thing that other diagram didn't show is that you can have pulse width modulation, and um, they sort of do it at, a, at sort of a maximum of eight pulse width modulations. Here they go zero to seven, and they do it in pairs A and B. And then they start to repeat again over here. So I guess it just depends how you want to assign your, uh, which pins you want to assign for pulse width modulation. Um, but they give you a fair bit of flexibility there. Um, right. Uh, just looking at the, the um, layout of the board, um, apparently the specs are max temperature of 85C. I've read somewhere they've now gone for certification to have a minimum temperature of minus 40 C. So um, initially they only had it certified to minus 20. So I think that's got through. Um, the five volt bus can be plus or minus 10 percent. I get the V bus. Um, that's the five volts from the USB. And VSYS is the one that you, where you can put batteries to feed it, run it off batteries or something. And you can go from 1.8 volts to 5.5 volts on that VSYS pin. Um, it's a bit hard to know how much current you'll draw. It depends on what other devices and resistors and things you've got hanging around the place. But um, it, it seems to draw less than 100 milliamps. And um, in fact, when it goes to sleep, in, in, depending on how you've written your code, but if it, if it if it goes into sleep mode, it's down to 1.4 milliamps, so it's very, very, low. very low power consumption. Um, size is 21 millimeters across by 51 millimeters long. And there are three chips on it. The big one is the 
Raspberry Pi chip. Um, the U2 is the back boost switching regulator that gives you 3.3 volts to, to run the CPU. And U3 is the um, flash, two, two megabytes of flash. Uh, you see, there's a crystal down here, 12 megahertz crystal. I, I assume that feeds straight into the main chip and goes, might have go through a doubler or a tripler or whatever. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so in summary of when you buy your Pico board, what you get on it is three ICs, 18 capacitors, a crystal, two diodes, one MOSFET, um, one inductor, 15 resistors and a switch. There you go. And on the back side of it, there's six test points. Okay, not bad for eight bucks, I thought, really. Um, they do provide this schematic um, of the Pico module. I'll just zoom in a bit on a couple of spots. Um, this here is the USB coming in and it's providing the VBUS power. Um, it drops through here. This is where the VSYS power can be applied if you had batteries and it won't go back out that way. Um, somehow they've got this voltage divider and they say GPIO pin 24. And I don't know what, if you go to that pin, I should be able to ground it or I could potentially raise it to VBUS, but um, if I ground it, I don't quite know what that divider would do and, and what the purpose of this. I haven't found a document, anyway, what that does. Um, over here, there's another GPIO pin, and that can be used to kind of program how the um, buck boost um, regulator works. This is producing the 3.3 volts, and you can have it in um, the PFM mode and pulse width modulation mode. So um, that's how that, why that one gets gobbled up and it's not available. Pin 25 comes out, goes through a resistor and has a little lead and that's on board the, uh, on, the on the chip, uh, on the Pico module. And I found this over here. It claims that GPIO pin 29 ADC3 and it's got this little story here about this MOSFET here stopping leakage back into VSYS, I think. But I get the impression that this is for measuring the voltage on VSYS. And I don't quite know. I mean, the 3.3 probably makes the MOSFET go. But, but anyway, we can look at that later. I get a, I get a number that comes out here. And uh, I suspect if I had the right multiplier, then it should really be reading the voltage for VSYS. Okay, and then I've put down the bottom here, we've got ADC4, which is analog to digital converter number four, and it's internal into the, um, the chip, and it's monitoring the CPU temperature. Um, and we can actually take a look at that as well. Um, okay, so we've gone through the three, three um, nesting stages. Now we can go a bit external to the... Um, the, the uh, Raspberry Pi Pico, and um, they have um, learning kits for you to play with. This is one that comes out, I think this is 73 bucks, I think that's from uh, PB Tech. And uh, so you get your, your Raspberry Pi with a header, uh, you get a, a breadboard, USB cables, um, I think those are ultraviolet, but there's switches and volume controls and resistors and a little LCD display, I think. Um, so, yeah, not a bad little one to get started with. Um, I don't know how they use the, oh, that little alarm. That's got to be alarm. Yeah, I don't think they put an 8-ohm speaker in there. Um, another evaluation type kit, this one's 110 bucks, is um, it's just a whole bunch of different sensors that you can uh, connect up. Um, so you monitor gas or color or flame or hall effect or infrared, things like that. Um, so much like, I'm pretty sure Arduino, if you go into JK, you'll find a whole bunch of Arduino kits. So I think these are pretty much the same. So I assume they're all made by Raspberry Pi, the little sensors. Yes, I think I got into that. Um, here's another kit. This one here has, um, 
a color display and it has then there's the um the pico module and then this one here with pinouts i think the underside of it looks like that and what is it it's an imu sensor whatever that is okay so that's another little kit and it, it sort of has this uh, what do you call it motherboard that the the three three little modules all plug into okay. um oh this is just zoomed in a bit and i'm showing um devices and another another type of motherboard this one provides audio i think audio and video yeah, it's got a svga socket and a couple of the left and the right uh, audio um so there's there's also third party guys getting involved in the app this this pico display here color display is from another manufacturer called from moroni limited and also make you know the pico board itself is not um, isn't, it's not no one anyone can make one of those if they want it by the looks and so technology have made a, their own equivalent of a pico board they're using the raspberry pi chip and i guess this is their flash ram their 3.3 regulator or something in their crystal um, and if you look if you start googling there's there's more and more and more of these third party chips coming out um modules coming out at, with the the raspberry pi chip being used um all right so now i just move on to a bit of hardware theory about um, um using the gpio pins and um, you've got basically 3.3 volts and uh, and ground for running um through the inside the darker green is meant to be the rp2040 chip and surrounding that the lighter green is the um, pico module so it's programmable there's two resistors there and you can program which one you want to use so um, the gpio pin which will it comes out of the the chip and goes out off the board the pico module that pin can either be an output or an input so um, if it's an output then you've just got to concern yourself with how much current am i going to draw when i come out of, on that pin and feed it through a device if it's an input then you're going to have to say am i going to use a pull-up resistor or a pull-down resistor um, i think here's an example of adding a switch so when i close the switch i want a signal to come in to the um, uh, processor and indicate either a one or a zero so if i close this switch <coughs> this resistor pulls up to high to low i close it sorry i close it yeah normally with it open it, it's pulled high to the three volt so i just have a one there when i close it i, I drag that signal down to ground and uh, and it'll be a zero okay and then the opposite is I have a switch tied to the 3.3 um, volt line and I program to say I want a pull up resistor. When I close this, it will put a high on, on that um, it signal going into the, the uh, chip. Okay, and so that's something when I set up um, for a GPIO port to have a pin in, I have to state whether I want to program for pull up or pull down depending on how i've configured my circuit um i mentioned that uh pin 25 comes out of the chip but it doesn't come out of the module and in fact on the on the module it goes to a 470 ohm resistor and then a lead so we can run little tests without having to wire up a lead and then make a little lead flash or something and um, if we want an external um uh lead then we come out of a gpio pin that come, is also presented on the pins on the module and then through a resistor to a lead to ground and uh to, i put 100 to 470 ohm depends on the um what is it, the, the i don't know forward bias of the, of the of the lead as to how much resistance you need there so you you 
yeah, and, and how much how much current is required to run the lead at full blast, basically. But normally less than twenty milliamps, I think. Um, okay, oh, so that's that's the hardware. Any questions so far? Uh, perhaps I'm going to have a little look at um, the one I've got here. So that's that's my hardware. Um, USBs plugged in. Uh, it's sitting on a little breadboard I've got. Um, I plugged a switch in here, which goes up to pin that round wire goes to pin well, pin 19 on the breadboard. It's actually GPIO port 14. And uh, that, oh no, that's a brown wire. 19 is light brown. Yeah, light brown. This other one here. Uh, th this one here, this switch will be tied to uh, ground somehow. The green wire there comes over and goes over to my positive. <laughs> okay, it's tied to. Okay, that switch. Green wire there, orange. Okay, that that this little switch is a. Uh, it goes to the positive rail when it when it closes, and this switch here used to go to the negative rail, but I've actually added, see, can you see that? I've got a, another switch, which, which goes to, that, to the negative rail. Um, so I've got two types of switches, and I've got the, the lead is here, that's the GPIO pin 25 lead, and I've got an external lead coming off, um, I think, Pin 20 is GPIO port 16, going through a resistor of 100 ohms and then through my little lead there and then away to, to the ground rail, the negative rail there. Okay. Um, so let's see if we can get some software in that and uh, make it work. Um, so I'll just launch my other slideshow. Right, so now we move on to the, the software. Um, and we use MicroPython, and um, it claims to be a full implementation of Python tree programming language that runs directly on embedded hardware like the Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, it also runs on a lot of, probably you can run it on an Arduino, I don't know, it runs on quite a few different um, little um, microcontrollers. Um, what we have is an interactive prompt so, and uh, we can execute commands immediately via the USB serial port, or we can, um, um, yeah, or we can run programs that are, are stored on the flash. Um, okay. uh, there's additional modules that are supplied for accessing low-level um, chip-specific hardware. Yeah. We'll have a look at that later. Um, for documentation, Raspberry Pi puts out some documentation, which if you want to have a look, this is one of the, the documents here. And there's quite a few documents from Raspberry Pi, plus there's also documentation on the micropython.org website. And the actual um, download of RP2-Pico, the, um, the micropython for for the Pico is, is from the MicroPython.org website. Um, we also need uh, a development, an integrated development environment, and there's one called Phony, which is um, an IDE for beginners, and you'll see it looks like it's written in Tekinta, and um, they have a website there, it's a GitHub site where you can um, get, get a release from. Um, you can install it. You, well, I got it. Um, it was a bit down rev. There's a sudo apt install. Um, you've got to put in Tekinta and, and uh, Sony, or you can do a pip install. Um, I, I did the pip install. It was a bit bit newer release, um, but I think both would work all right. Um, now, system though, is that what I, the, the the question is, how do we install it? Now, 
it might be easier just to, if I, I think if I go here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, just a matter of, okay. We get the file, and we um, push this button down, we plug in the USB port, and then it starts downloading a file. No, it doesn't. It, it, it turns it in. Oh, dear. Too fast. <laughs> Okay, well, it goes around again. Um, and there's Sony running. I'll just try it again. Okay, so we download MicroPython to my Linux computer, and then I hold that button down when I plug the USB port in, and it turns it into being a file system. Uh, and it, I grab the downloaded file and drop it into that file system. As soon as that's happened, it then converts it, it stops being in download mode and stops being presenting a file system. And then the last thing is I can I can now use the IDE. But it all happens, you're sort of downloading, downloading, and boof, it's all finished <laughs> and you've got an IDE. So um, yeah, I thought that was a bit easier to show that way than the other way. Let's close that off. Has anyone, nobody's said anything, has it? Okay. Um, yeah, so so this is me. Um, I dragged, this was the download I got of, um, it's called a UF2 file, which I believe is some Microsoft standard, of, what does it stand for? Something um, firmware, uh, no, not firmware, no, Flash, uh, Flash 2 standard or something. Um, so when when you first plug it in, it shows up as a device for for my Linux computer, and it, the device just has two files on it. And inside this info u2.txt, all it says is that. So I, it's just an identifier, and I just drag this and drop it into drag this from a download folder or where I put it, drop it in there, and um, and then it. Once it's finished, it seems to just reboot or whatever it does, and, and I'm suddenly into using um, uh, MicroPython. Um, you can download the MicroPython tar file, which I did, and, and expand it, and you can use a, a make command and compile it all and, and, and generate your own version. And I think, I don't know exactly, I guess the make command determines what goes in that US2 file. But um, there seems to be in here, we could look later on, <coughs> there seems to be a lot of um, files which are, um, uh, oh, example files and things like that. But they don't show up, they don't seem to be included in the US2 file, they don't come across. So anyway, you can look at that. Um, so that's got it up and running and now theoretically Sony will connect and with Sony by default it will it would be going to my user bin Python 3 a, a, as a local IDE for for my Python 3 on my Linux computer but um, we, we can now see that it displays MicroPython Raspberry Pi Pico so that's what we can click on I don't know why it displays two of them but anyway one says a chip and one says a Python um, so we do that and it doesn't work. We get an error message, and, but it's very helpful because it says that we, my user account probably doesn't have dial out so that the um, USB port can actually communicate over, over, over it. Um, so I, I do these commands below and yippee, I get my three hour prompt here. Um, this is Tony, this is where I write code. This is the shell where I see what's um, happening. It's identified itself now. I think if you go back here, it was Python 3.10.0. Um, here it's now MicroPython v1.19. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, and so we can start writing little things there. Um, one of the things we can actually type is help. And um, so it says, welcome to MicroPython. Um, it's got two modules that it wants to tell you about which are specific to the uh, Raspberry Pi. One's called Machine and the other one's called RP2. 
and then it proceeds, whoops, proceeds to tell you about some of the pins, how, how to uh, program the different pins, um, how, to, how to make use of the analog to digital converter and uh, read data from it. Um, the pulse width modulation, you can set the fre frequency duty cycle, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know about I2C buses and uh, small peripheral interfaces. Um, there's a timer which we'll use and um, it will uh, you know, just fire a, off a callback every second or however long often you want it to do. Um, and with regard to the pins, 0 to 29 come out of the Pico module on a, a number. Yeah, 26 and 29 have analog to digital converting um, capabilities. And the modes when you're using a pin for I.O. is either pin in, pin out, or pin alt. I, don't, I guess, I don't know, I'm not sure what the alt alternate one is. And the modes you can have them is to pull up or pull down. That's for that set of resistors. So that's a little bit of help there. Um, if we go help modules, then this gives me the, um, the set of modules that were shipped um, or are installed in there. And here's my RP2 and my machine. They put a, a, a micro, a U in front of everything. See, like, here's U-Sys and U-OS. But you don't seem to have to type the U. It, it, you can just put, uh, you'll see here, if I go DIR, I have machine and I have RP2. If I go DIR machine, um, different things I can set up like analog to digital converters. Real, real, it's got a real time clock. We can show that later. Um, the timer, uh, UARTs, things like that. Um, so the Raspberry Pi has, doesn't have a real time clock, but the Pico has. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And it seems like it gets, as soon as I plug in, as soon as I turn it on, it must inquire to the Linux, gets this time off my Linux box through the USB port. Oh, it was my guess because there's no, there's no battery, nothing to keep yeah. it going. Yeah. But, it, 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 you know, I've got a little program that plays around with that. We'll run that later. If, you, if I forget, don't worry. Um, yeah, here's me importing you, sis, and here's me importing sis, and they both display is the same. Right. Um, if we take a look at sys, we can version info, it says it's 3.4 and sys.version might is you know, a bit more explanation. sys.platform is RP2. Um, I believe it is actually based on something like 3.10 but I don't know why they didn't keep the numbering the same as the real Python number. So, because um, it's got 3.4, was async IO around then? 3.4? You need Lawrence. <laughs> yeah, he's not coming tonight. Um, see, if we look down here, we've got async IO, INET, core, and event, functions, lock, stream. So there's quite a bit of. So I think that takes at least, I thought that was 3.5 or something that async IO came about. So, um, we've also got an OS, <laughs> and, uh, even though we haven't got an OS, and uh, so we can go DIOS, and it's got, you know, like get current working directory and list of directory and stuff. If we do OS uname, it gives us a bit of um, statistics about the, or information about the, the um, Pico module and the uh, chip. Um, if we get current working directory, it just gives a backslash, and well, at the moment it does. Um, list DIR, these are little programs which I've written, okay, and um, and are stored in my, um, in that flash RAM on board the Pico module. You need lots of flash RAM, yeah. Um, actually, yeah, I've only got 256 KB of flash. I think when when that um, th throny first linked, it said I had something like 134 
uh, kilobytes free. And at that point, I didn't have any of my programs written, I think, when I took that screenshot. I'll just see. Oh, I didn't go back. Oh, down the bottom, I thought it said, uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, it, I've sort of got to work out how you work out when you're going to run, run out of, of flash RAM. Um, you know, how, or if you had a program and it was storing data, and then you later copied every 24 hours or something, you pumped it up to your to your PC, then uh, how much you could, data you could store. Um, so it's time to write a program. So you can do print hello world, and it'll come back with hello world. Um, then if we want to get into using these pins, we can from machine import pin, and then we can say lead is pin number 25, and if we want to pin out uh, on that pin, and if we say lead on as a function and lead off, then it will turn the little lead on the Pico module on and off. And if we want to get a little bit more sophisticated, there is a timer. So as well as importing the tim, the pin, we import the timer and uh, instantiate the timer there and um, build a little callback routine called tick. And um, uh, we want the lead to just toggle. So each time it goes through the callback, it will just turn the lead to its opposite state. And then the timer is um, set up like as follows. Time.init and uh, frequency two and a half seconds, I think it is, and periodic callback tick. We, I'll run that later, you can see. Um, <coughs> is that the next thing we might want to do is save the little program. So instead of operating at three hour prompt, we now put the program into the IDE's um, buffer up here. And we click on um, that one there for save. And it will say, where do you want to save it? The Raspberry Pi or on your computer. So we, we save it to the Raspberry Pi. Um, so it, or, it shows things I've already saved there, and I'm going to call this one timer pin 25 flash. And um, having saved it there, um, in fact, when you click on run, it will do a save before run um, from here on once it's got a name. Um, oh, the other thing I should mention is if I had a file in there called main.py, when you power on, it will run that. So that, that's how you have a build an app that, that you know, can survive power fails and things. Um, so I, I haven't put a main dot pie in there. But um, yeah, so that one's a run. And when we run it, the lead will start flashing. And then I can push stop over here. And it, and it will uh, help the program. Um, and all we're doing is feeding out from that pin and making the lead flash. So the, the what we do is from machine import pin and lead equals pin 25, pin out, and then we just say lead on or lead off. Or you can lead dot value equals one, or in brackets one. Um, or if we have an external one, in this case I decided to use pin 16. So from, it should be lowercase from, but um, uh, we've just added this one lead equal pin 16 pin out okay so that's how an external lead works and for switches um, I've used pin 14 pin 15 so this one is is the um, pull down resistor is used to, to when I close this the, uh, a zero basically goes in there when I open it a one goes in there this one when I close this a one goes in, and then I open it, a zero goes in. Um, and, oh, that's just combining. Oh, th this is more programming. For switch one, I say pin 14 is pin in, and it's a pull down, right? So I have to define that there. Whereas switch two, this resistor is pulled up. So it's um, pin in. I'm using a pull-up resistor, okay. So I have to build that into the uh, initialization of those switches. 
and this is this is showing two switches and a lead so um with my lead there and then the final whoops what's that one Hmm? Ah, okay. Um, okay, so th this is what my little board that I'll show you looks like. So I've got two LEDs and two two switches. Okay, and and that's the, the kind of the programming that's used to make them work. Um, so we'll try demoing those things. Remember, what's to do where? So if I like that, and display that, and bring that here. And, um, you could do a split screen if you move them to the right and left. The windows. Oh. Oh. Right. Move it further, further, further. Yep. Huh. Good job. To the right cool. Um, right. So what I'm gonna, um, okay. So if I open this, and um, what do I call it? Timer was the one I said we'd have a look at. So the code is um, we're going to use pin twenty five, and we're going to go out on that pin, and uh, then we're going to go. I don't think we should be there. Um, then we've. Uh, going to use the time module that we've imported and um, we'll set up 2.5 periodic and pull back the tick. So the little lead is right there in theory. And it's uh, over here, runner. And you know, yeah, you can see that blinking. All right, so that's that's about as exciting as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and uh, theoretically, if I push stop, it will stop. Oh, I said sorry. So I've got one hit. That should flash faster. Oh, slower. Huh. Isn't that slower than before? Isn't it? Yeah. That is about one, one second. Yeah, one second. Oh yeah, two and a half is zero point four. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you yeah, it'll get it gets so that um, you can't see it because it flashes too fast. Uh, yeah, it's going that there, but you know, once your eye gets fooled and this camera gets fooled, you can't keep up. Okay, so that's that little one. Um, what else we got there? Uh, I'll just show you the. Um, runtime clock. Um, th there was a bit of me mucking around here. I don't quite know the current status of this program. Um, it, it it comes back with um, with when I get the time. It comes back with the year, the month, the day, and then the day of the week, and then the hour, minute, second, and then this here should, I guess, be the day of the year, but it doesn't seem to compute that. You know, like being 300 and something or other. Um, well, that's that's how the, it, it gets returned with a date time from, from uh, a normal... Hmm? That's not microsecond? No, no, it's... Um, it, well, when, when when I use real Python yeah. on there, it, it comes back yeah, as. Um, I don't know if I've got examples here. Anyway, I can't. I'll just run it and see what happens. Cool. Ah. So Monday, twelfth of December, two thousand twenty-two at twenty twenty forty-seven. Yep. Okay, and. Um, uh, the rest of it is me. Yeah, see oh, nice. that three forty six. Well, that's that's what P the day of P. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but I, I think I that's me pasting that in from. Isn't it? I didn't calculate that, did I? Oh well. 
Okay, okay well, whatever. So anyway, it's got a little clock. So just got to bear in mind that it comes out in that format and it's up to you to write a bit of code to convert it to, to the other format. Okay, so that's that one. Um, uh, the other thing is you can have pulse width modulation. I'll try this. Um, the <laughs> pulse width modulation, here I'm going to have a frequency of a thousand, which will be pulsing far faster than you can see. Right, so I'll just blur it and you can't see the pulses. But if I change the, um, what is it, the duty cycle, if I make it 100%, then it's kind of always on. If it's at 50%, it's half on, half off, right? And so as I change the duty cycle, then then it will uh, dim. And, and if I bring it, I can bring it back up. So here, what do I do? Um, I, the duty cycle has a range of zero to 65,536 or 35 or something. So I, I'm gonna change the duty cycle every 20 microseconds. I'm gonna start with it at zero and then I'm gonna do it reversed. I'm gonna come down now, I can't remember whether zero is fully on and fully off, but anyway, we're we'll running. So, I wonder if I should turn the lamp off. Oops. There. I'll run that. Oh, it's that lead. I thought it was, oh, yeah, pin 16. So that, well, it sort of cut off a bit fast, didn't it, on the way down. So, Went up to bright, coming down, coming down, coming down. Poof. Mm. Mm. And if I if I change this one, does that stop? Uh, change it to pin uh, twenty-five and run that, and it should be this. Yeah, this little fella. It's going up and down. No. Um, yeah, this lead here that I'm using, this one here, is, you know when they have those things in the balloons in the park and kids buy those little things that flash? Yeah. And then by the time the show's over, the batteries are flat yeah. and they chuck them out. I was walking down the road and I found one that had been thrown out. All right. So uh, it seems like it's quite bright and it doesn't draw much, many milliamps. So I tried putting my multimeter in line with it and it was only drawing about two or three milliamps. So wow. uh, I don't know whether it's something, something good about that lead or <laughs> whether that's what, I mean, I guess that's what they want for a little game thing for a kid. You want it as bright as possible. And, and last a while. Last a while, yeah. Okay, so that's another one. Um, Blink. We'll just try blink. I don't know what, what do I do here? Lead on, lead off, sleep. Will that keep going? Mm. Oh, yeah, range 10. Yeah, I'm going to see what it is. Oh, sleep one second. So that's one. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's easier ways to do that. That timer and stuff. Um, well, I'll see what get info is. Oh, yeah, we've already seen that. I was trying, I can't actually get the help. I was trying to get help modules, you, mm -hmm. but it won't, it won't, it doesn't bring it in as a list. I can get a DIR mm -hmm. and bring that in, but I can't get a help modules. Mm -hmm. That's where I had that problem one. Another presentation I was, when it was something like yeah, I used, I forget what I used, some some particular module to, to actually read those, that help, those help, the returned help. And you have to reprogram standard out and standard in or, uh, anyway. 
gave up on that one. Uh, blink. Oh, okay. Now, yeah, this is this is in the book. <laughs> so I'm not lying here. <laughs> um, and yeah, the temperature sensor measures the VBE voltage of a bias bipolar diode connected to the fifth ADC channel. So that's the internal yeah, so typically the VBE is 0 0.706 volts at 27 degrees. Okay. And so we want the temperature sensor to be machine dot ADC4 and has a conversion factor, I guess 3.3 .3 is the voltage, divided by 65535. Um, and then we, we get a reading from the tension, temperature temperature, we do a read, and we've got this conversion factor, and then we have this algorithm, and then we get the temperature. Um, so here's, here's the code that I'm using, that's the, the conversion factor, and then um, there's also another pin 29, which I figured was supposed to tell me what Vsys was, but this is not in the book anywhere. This is just my my code. I haven't found what what voltage I'm supposed to get. I don't know what the, and, and whether it's you know, linear or not. But it goes up and down. Um, so this will get the temperature and get the voltage. So and then sleep. I'll make. I'll just do it once. Okay. So it's it gets a reading of one four. 179 from the analog to digital converter. Then when it feeds it through the conversion, it gets that number. And then when it does more maths, it says it's at 22.36 degrees. Okay. I can put my finger right here. And for this voltage reading, I get 8177, which I figure is the voltage on Vsys of 4.83, uh, only because I put my multimeter on it and said I'm going to make one point. I'm going to make 8177 equal 4.83, but um, <clears throat> if the voltage fluctuates. Um, one thing to, to note is that, see these fluctuations I've put up here, where I say uh, 8145, 8161, 8177, that, that's the best resolution you get at. It's a 12-bit, and that's converted to 16-bit, so every it goes in jumps of 16 Okay, and and that was that's also I think to make it backward compatible with some other analog to digital converters so that so that it's faking it. It's only really got from zero to four. Oh, yeah, oh, eight thousand. Uh, I don't know what the maximum. And here I'm at fourteen thousand. Anyway, uh, 4, 000, yeah, but these have already. Yeah, I think it's zero to four zero ninety six. Is, is yeah. if I was going up one increment at a time, so they just fake it by multiplying it all by sixteen, and then it pretend, and then it effectively goes from zero to sixty-three thousand, is it sixty-five thousand five hundred and thirty-six? Okay, so, so that's a little thing. Um, I think with the temperature, if I if I put it on fast, is we'll change this to uh, two seconds. Um, I'll put my finger on there. Oh, is it going up? Yep, 25. Yeah. I'm sort of taking the heat off. Okay, so that temperature thing does seem to jump around a bit. Um, and that's in the book. <laughs> so, But as for my voltage, it just stays standard. I don't know how I could draw more current. Have now the flashing as well. Can you run multiple programs at the same time? Yeah, um, the LED's flashing though. The LED is being run off a three point three volt regulator, and so, oh, yeah, might that might. I mean, what you think it might draw enough current to? Mm -hmm. um, what's a quick? Where's my little LED flashing? Blink. No, um, yeah. This one. I get that to all work in there as well. Can you run two programs in parallel? I think so. <laughs> yeah, just wondering. I mean, you have two cores, right? Ah, uh, 
Yeah, there's a there's a section on threads. I haven't read that yet. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's next time's presentation. Um, where was I? Um, this one. Um, I wonder if I. Probably, yeah, yeah. Um, each one I could just say tick, couldn't I? After I do a get tick, after I. How do you do that like that? And then it will go actually into the wild through? What? Or will it stop in the 10 minutes? Oh, it's blinking. Yeah, it 4.83. 4.83. Yeah, it's not. The, the blinking LED, though, is being run off the 3.3 mm -hmm. volt regular. And it's probably, I mean, it's meant to have one. Couldn't have one more. Yeah, the temperature might be yeah, but the uh, but the the lead, I mean the voltage. Mm. I think I need to put a bit more strain on it than that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. What's the next one we got? <coughs> um, pulse. Oh, did we say that pulse was not? I showed the didn't didn't, we, yeah. yeah, real time clock switch. Okay. Um. Okay, well, you can have a switch where, what's this, what's this doing? Okay, this is, pin 14 is the pull down. Right, when I push the switch one, it should make the lead come on, and here's my toggle. If the next time I push it, it should make it go off. I could use toggle in there, but I'll do that later on. So let's just see what happens if I push switch one. Is it giving on one? Take it off to zero. Okay. It's not doing anything to the lead. Where was the lead going? No, the lead was going. Oh, oh the lead one. one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ooh, gee, nice. All right. Um, Okay, uh, but what I was supposed to prove with that <laughs> is how crazy it was, how susceptible to noise. If I've got a crappy switch, hmm, can't prove that. Well, there are ways and means. Um, what was the next one? What was that one called? Switch. You're doing it. Was that? Yeah. See? Oh, right. Yeah. That wasn't what we had before, was it? No. Okay. So, yeah, we're getting a bit more carried away here. Um, it's the same program, isn't it? Well, pin 14, this is the pull down one. I think this is a crappy switch. Let's see what happens here. If I push this one. What's happening here? This goes to ground. Oops, maybe that one will fall out. This goes to pin. Was it the other switch there or the one that's blue on? Switch one. Oh, was it the other one? Switch one. Yeah, this is yeah. it. Okay. But see how I get a burst? Of interrupts and that. Anyway, we try. I tried to make it so it was better, which was. It, it, it's called deep bounce. It's called bounce switch bounce. So switch interrupt routine. I think this is the one. I thought I had. Cool. Okay, we've got switch one is a pull down. Switch two is a pull up. We've got both leads working. Now we're using toggle. The, toggling both leads and I've included in here okay so if I if I find the switch value equal to one I then wait for 40 milliseconds and I, I see if the switch value is equal to one again so if I'm pushing it down and it it sort of gets a bit of noise and it cuts out within 40 milliseconds then I say it's not a good switch so you've got to have a one for 
being detected and then another one in 40 milliseconds. Um, and the same for the other switch. And so if we run that, and I'll try this button. Yeah, see that cracked down. It should be one push and it's off, one push and it's on, but it but it flicked. Maybe 40 milliseconds needs to be increased or something. I'll try this other one. I thought this switch here was more hairy. Yeah. See how it gave a couple of flashes? Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's not it's not always switching as required. So there's various ways you can play around with um, trying to, I'm trying to do a software debounce, but I mean, you can put capacitors across the switch and things like that to, um, to try and stop it. I remember keyboards, they've got a debounce. I think it's, um, it's a timing thing, isn't it? When you push a key down, a sort of an X and a Y says, oh, that key's down, yeah, X and why say find oh there's a key down here and then they come back a few milliseconds later and say oh is it still down oh yeah it must be valid and therefore they allow the keystroke to go through from my old days of fixing computers yeah, it's very annoying if that no longer works and you have bouncing keys yeah oh okay you can't restart a second program while the other one's going you can stop it um and I don't know whether I've got any more. Let me see. What, is there anything? We did the runtime clock. We did the switch timer. Pulse with other. I think that's. I think that might be my lot that I've got so far. Yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> so, unless you want to sit and write a uh, a little program, you're welcome. You can come up here and, and write one. But, uh, Thanks, Ian. It's all right. Yeah. I hope you left that little story. Mm. Yeah. Uh, thank you about this. This is a long way back. Um, oh, Nicky switches. Um, and I was thinking that if you set it up, normally the problem is it's not a case of the switch momentarily coming on, because normally the way they work, they're well separated. If you're not pushing the switch, something's happening. Okay, you don't get false comings on. Mm -hmm. But it's when you put it down and you make momentary contact and it's, it's noisy and it's going off. Yeah. yeah. Off, 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 off. And, and, but it doesn't stay off. So you really only need to test it to see if it's been lifted rather than to see if it's come down. Do you see with the logical one I'm talking about there? Yeah. But, so if you, if, you, if you set it up so that it always comes on when, when it, you, it detects a um, contact, then you'll find it's, it, it's quite reliable. Okay. So the problem, the problem is how long does it stay on and, and, and it's what it's happens it. when it disappears. Yeah. In other words, do you make it deliberately hold for a while and then if it comes back on again, you do a kind of reset as it will and it carries on being on. Yeah. yeah um, it's a sort of, what I'm driving here is sort of the underlying logic of yeah. the fact that it's mm -hmm. asymmetrical the way it behaves. Yeah. You can't, see, so I'm trying to make the switch have two functions. The first time you push it, it turns on. The next time you push it, it turns off. Okay, so you want a toggle. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. In, in that case, you don't need to test if it comes on. But you do need to test if it stays off. Uh, well, as soon as the pulse comes through from me turning it on, yeah, then I, I'm it looking at the should hold and stay on. Yeah, but I'm also looking at the leading edge. Yeah. So, so you can look at leading or trailing edge. So, right. if this with the button off, if this comes, uh, the green wire comes to ground. No, green wine. No, this one goes to plus five. All right, this is which one is it? Yeah, tell me. Yeah. So plus five gets when it's off. It's internally being pulled 
by this orange wire. You can't really see that in normal light. What? Pointing. Oh, people can't see it. Well, those pins have, to, uh, I'm presuming you, you've got a facility for programming that has got to pull up or pull down. Yeah, yeah. The pin. I'll just go back to the switch. Um, yeah, you don't have to provide yeah. it externally. The, 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 it will trigger the interrupt, the IRQ, on the rising signal. I mean, I could make them, which ones are going to be? If this one, when that's off, it will already be high. So when I, no, it, it, when it's off, it's low. When I push the button, it goes high, so it will be on the rising. Mm -hmm. Whereas switch two should be, might be on the, is it falling? Or what's the rising? Is rising, uh, I thought I would have got it. Give it a go. Yeah. Um, so this one here, that clicking now, on, off. So that's doing it quite nicely, isn't it? Oop. <laughs> What's this, this one? So this one here. Hmm. This one's. The other thing is, I probably should have soldered wires and things. Yeah, I was going to say, have you, have you got, when those wires move, are we getting an intermittent connection on them? I, I, th I think this is a pretty dicky switch. Because or is there an external switch you're playing with? There's no external one right now. Yeah, there's an external. See, I'm holding, I'm, I'm holding the switch there. Uh -huh. And I'm just pushing with my finger. But um, you know, I don't know whether if I change that to it goes any better. But I mean, maybe you have maybe the answer is to have two switches. The one always turns it on, and the other always turns it off. Yes, that's what another. Yeah, it like, doesn't matter if it's noisy turning it on, and it tries turning it on. You know, twenty times in a, in a, in a second or something, it, it will go on. <laughs> the problem is, is that one's the tricky when it's actually meant to be off. But... Yeah. And how much time delay you can tolerate? Yeah. Yeah. The um, the sort of part of the reason why I wanted to demonstrate this is with these. When the signal's going in, I don't need to have any resistors. I'm, I'm directly wiring the pin to ground via the switch. Or yeah. And I'm using the programmable pull-up, pull-down resistors that are inside this chip. Yeah. Okay. But when I go through a lead, then I'm directly drawing power from that pin through the resistor to the lead yeah. and then to ground. And, um, and that's where a lead at 20 mils is okay. But if you start to, you know, if you try to run a light bulb, you, know, you, you grind to a halt. So I think, though, if I have another little circuit board and it's got, say, 5 volts and it has a TTL input that's swinging 3.2 to 0, yeah. then I could just directly couple yeah. from without needing any resistive um, right. or anything like that and directly couple to it, and I will be drawing absolute minimal current out of that um, Pico module yeah. on that pin. Yeah. So, you know, running a lead is probably about as far as you you want to go for, mm -hmm. for um, drawing current. You know, it, it's quite a thing that the situation that I remember after you know, the process of the time of the relay, okay, oh, it's just a single transistor. Mm -hmm. Two transistors. Bloody great big relay. <laughs> right. But, but yeah. I think the biggest problem with lots of electricity is turning it off, not turning it on. It's it, it, as it's it's trying to solve problems. Yeah. It, the arcing occurs, yeah. whereas clunking it on is. is mm. yeah. Yeah. And then, if you've got inductors floating around outside. Mm.
Anyway, I'll, um, I might pot around with a few things. One of the things I've got in mind is to try and make a little heart um, monitor. You, know, you have a little strap around your hair and it somehow picks up your heartbeat, whether I can feed that in through the analog to digital converter. And then the question would be how much data I can store in, in say, a day or something. I'm just play it on the LED, right? <laughs> oh, it stops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, uh, but I, I thought actually getting if I was doing enough sampling, I might be able to get draw little graphs, you know, get get the uh, the waveform. Yeah. <laughs> I'm walking around. Well, one but, of the uh, was it the uh, one of the other boards that you were showing? They actually had a pico display on the yeah, right board there. Mm. Yeah. So a little LCD for display, so you can display something there. Yeah. You but, can calculate sort of like your heart rate and then display that. Yeah. I think if you had the Wi-Fi one, then then I could have like a little strap with the mm -hmm. with the chip and the Wi-Fi and a battery and, and wander around. And then when I yeah. walk past, I Bluetooth yeah. uploads. Yeah. Yeah. Bluetooth will be better. Wi-Fi will power. Yeah. I assume it has Bluetooth. Look that. WH. Look, look, look. Yeah. I think it's Bluetooth as well. Oh. Oh. Does this one have Bluetooth here? Or? No, you see, this one has got the LAN, the Wi Fi chip on it. That's why there's a big gap yeah. down the end. That's where the Wi Fi chip so it sits in here. But, um,. Yeah, I haven't I haven't read the spec on that whether it does. I think it does. It's on. There is. Um, I'm sure there'll be a variant turning up with Wi-Fi. Oh yeah, the, the Wi. You can buy the Wi-Fi one now, but it doesn't have the header pin, so I can't plug it into the. Can't do it as a development thing. With a one wire driver. Yeah. Oh, Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, um, so what you'd have to walk past and establish a connection and then have something on your computer to poll it and upload data. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 